the, the last song, there was a particular phrase in there that I, really just stood out to me. Uh, we've sung this song a number of times, and, and today it was just kind of quickened in my spirit. Um, I'm going to read the verse, and then I'll, I'll kind of explain what I'm thinking here. Uh, it says, You father the orphan, your kindness makes us poor. You shoulder our weakness, and your strength becomes our own. You're making me like you, clothing me in white, bringing beauty from ashes, for you will have your bride, free of all her guilt, and rid of all her shame, and known by her true name. <clears throat> you will have your bride, <clears throat> free of all her guilt and rid of all her shame. <clears throat> when we come to Christ, we become that bride. And one of the most deceitful things, one of the most horrific things that the enemy does is he speaks the lies that keep us in our guilt and our shame. And we can understand that God has forgiven us in the abstract, but so often we have certain areas of sin in our life that we just feel like God's never going to be able to forgive us for. Areas of weakness, areas where we stumble. And personally, I can look at some of the egregious sins throughout history, and I can see that God could forgive those. But then in my own personal life, I struggle with Him forgiving my sin. And yet, Scripture tells us that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> we still have an accuser. The devil still stands up and he points his finger and he stomps and he shouts. He makes a loud fuss. And if we pay too close attention to him, we begin to fall under that lie. But see, Scripture also says we have an advocate, an intercessor. We have one that stands before the Father never ceasingly pleading our case, pleading our cause, and it's through His blood that we are found innocent, free of all charges. And when Christ comes back, He's coming for His bride. He will have His bride. Nothing can hold His bride from Him. See, when Jesus came the first time, He came meek, mild, a lamb led to slaughter. But when he comes back the next time, he's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's coming back in might and power and mounted on a white horse. And he will gather to himself his bride, never to be hurt, never to be harmed, never to shed tear again. And he will put all that is wrong to right. So I want to encourage you today if there is an area in your life where you are struggling with guilt or shame, it's a lie of the enemy. It has been washed in the blood of the Lamb. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us that He became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. Absolute, perfect, knowing no blemish. I want to encourage you today, quit listening to the lies. <clears throat> Set aside the guilt. Set aside the shame. Embrace salvation. Embrace what God has transformed you into. We're going to make mistakes. We'll probably make mistakes before the end of this service. We'll probably make a mistake. <laughs> it's covered. One sacrifice for all, and it was sufficient. Um, I want to say a couple of thanks. Uh, I've kind of fallen out of the habit, and, and I don't want to do that. Um, <clears throat> I want to say thank you 
to uh, Nathan and Lori DeBoer because every week <coughs> they make sure that the bulletins are printed and handed out. Nathan takes care of all the sound. Uh, last week when we had our service outside, uh, Nathan and Josh came, they got all of the sound pulled out, set up, and running so we could do our service outside. Um, they're always pitching in wherever a hand is needed. And I want to say thank you because so often the work that you do is unseen, um, behind the scenes. But I, I want you to know it's not unnoticed and it's not unappreciated. So thank you very much. Um, I have asked Benjamin and Shay uh, to come and share with us. They have a, a testimony that I think would be really cool uh, for us to hear. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Is Cohen actually going to be speaking? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, I was just going to take him over here and sit on pop the flat. Okay. Hello, okay. so everybody. As you know, we just had our fourth baby. Um, and we just want to kind of share really quick um, about that because God did a pretty cool thing um, with us, and I think even through us a little bit, regarding like the medical community and um, some stuff. So I would like to share that with you guys, and I think it's encouraging, um, definitely encouraged me. Um, Cohen is our fourth. Um, we have three boys and a girl. Judah is our first. We um, went to the hospital to have him, and it ended up having to be a C-section. Probably because of our ignorance, if we'd done more research and figured out how to have a baby, it probably could have came out a lot better. But um, after Judah, we got pregnant pretty quick, and so the doctor wanted us to have another C-section because he was concerned that the scar tissue on Shailen's uterus would possibly rupture during the labor, which could result in the death of the baby or the death of the mom or both. Um, a pretty common concern regarding um, vaginal births after cesareans, a VBAC, vaginal birth after cesarean, is if you try to do a birth naturally or, you know, without doing a C-section if you've already had one. And their concern is that um, if you try that, then the uterus could rupture um, unless you give enough time between pregnancies, essentially, and we didn't. Sorry. But, um, <laughs> So we got pregnant again after Declan, and um, same thing. He recommended that we have another C-section. Um, well, each time we've had a C-section, it's gotten progressively more uncomfortable and more, I guess, more complicated, would you say? And, um, and she definitely didn't want to keep having C-sections. We want to have lots of babies. So, I mean, if you look at Psalm 127, what's that? You're well on your way. <laughs> There's a, a passage in Psalms I want to share because I get a lot of flack at work for how many babies I have. I'm only 24 and I already have four children. That is, um, we already have a very large family for Americans. Um, so I just kind of want to share a verse that has been encouraging me. Um, it's actually ironically a song of ascents, which is a psalm you would sing as you're going ascending the hill to worship God um, in Israel. And one Psalm 127, I'll just read the whole psalm, it's only five verses. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the, re of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. The gate was essentially, I guess the closest thing we have is a courthouse to the gate. Because they had a lot of their legal disputes in the gate house of the city. Um, <clears throat> we get criticized because we have lots of children. They say that you can't financially handle it. It's foolish. It's um, irresponsible. Don't have there's no way you could pay enough attention to each of the children because there's so many of them, you can't afford it. Um, mostly, I just laugh at them because you know, if, if God wants you to not have very many children, that's between you and God. God has called us to have many children, and I think this here, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, are the children of one's youth. 
I don't want to go into battle with only a few arrows in my quiver. Um, it seems to me, in the Bible, anytime God wants to bless somebody, he gives them children. Anytime he wants to curse somebody, he takes their children away, or takes away their ability to have children. Um, and to me, somebody who, who says things like, you shouldn't have very many children, they're just missing out, in my opinion, because children aren't amazing. And so that's our stance. We want to have lots of children because we want to show this world what it's like to have a, a, a godly family, to raise children in the Lord. I want to raise up an army to change the world. Uh, so, pray for me. <laughs> but they really are, they are amazing. They, they've blessed my life so much and they've matured me so much. Uh, nothing matures you like having a child, I think. Um, or what's that? <laughs> um, but uh, so we we had three C sections. If we had done our research, we we could have probably done a vaginal birth yeah. any time along the way, because um, our doctor was saying that there's probably about a 50 percent chance of something bad happening if you tried to do a, a V back um, after one of these C sections. And that was very scary for them to say, okay, 50 percent chance of your wife or baby dying. So it's like, okay, we kind of got swept along with what the doctors said. But um, we really prayed a lot about Cohen before we had him, if we should do a C-section again. Because by the time you do four C-sections, I don't think anybody's really going to want to touch you if you want to do a V-back. But ironically, nobody wants to touch you if you've had three C-sections. <laughs> but um, so we prayed a lot. And one of the biggest things I learned in all this, and that's kind of one of the biggest points I want to tell you guys, is... is Knowing God's voice, and once you hear God's voice, to stick with it. And um, we prayed a lot about whether or not we should do a vaginal birth. And, um, and it wasn't really, I, I felt pretty confident about it the whole time until uh, we got to the hospital. <laughs> there were several things along the, during the pregnancy that confirmed it to me. We had a friend um, from Hamilton come over to our house and, and share with us that she believed we should do a, a, a be back, which should have been enough for us. But... But then we had felt a lot of peace about it. She gave us some books and we did a whole bunch of research. And the statistics really show that having repeat cesareans is more dangerous than having a VBAC. Um, despite what the doctors say. Um, but they don't have hardly any information about a VBAC after three C-sections. But, so we felt pretty confident that we should do a VBAC. You know, the whole, one, the whole term our doctor is supporting us. He wants us to have a, a C-section, but he supports our decision. And so we finally get to the hospital on August 4th. Um, well, we go there at 4.30 to do a routine checkup. And she's at two centimeters, and the doctor's there. We go out for some dinner, and, and she starts walking around, and she's at, you know, she's contracting every three minutes. And then we go to the hospital, and the doctor's gone. He's, he, he left on a vacation or something like that just a couple of hours after. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we get starting to get checked in and everything like that, and um, the nurse comes in and tells us that we either have to have a C-section or we have to go somewhere else. The doctor that's on call, Dr. Wyman, will not help us unless he does a C-section for us. So that's the only way they'll let us have a baby. Um, and so of course, right then and there, I'm like, well, what, what happened? What's going on? I mean, I thought God said we we're going to do a VBAC, and now they're just telling you have to do a C-section. They were they were very adamant about this, and we spent couple hours going back and forth with them, I think, um, with the nurse telling us, and then they brought in a, a doctor, a resident doctor who's studying on the, the campus um, to really try to convince us to do a C-section. And, and because they don't have very many information on three, you know, VBAC after three, um, most of the numbers they gave us were kind of just pulled out of the air. They don't really know. Nevertheless, it's still very scary to have a whole bunch of doctors coming in telling you that your wife and baby are going to die if you don't do what they say. Um, even though we had done lots of research about it, everything that I believe was really being called into question. Even I asked for someone in charge to come in, and uh, the director of the Department of Labor or whatever came in, and she said, um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good thing I don't remember her name because um, I'm trying to look her up, and uh, it's probably a good thing I don't remember her name. But she, she really tried to convince us because she pulled out the, the policy on, on the uh, the VBAC policy of the hospital and said that you can have a VBAC if you've only had one C-section or if you've had two, that you've also had a, a successful vaginal birth as well. And other than that, they don't recommend, they can't support you if you do a VBAC and you've had three C-sections. Uh, so that we fell under the category of a high-risk pregnancy. 
So, um, which the question I asked her was, because the doctor who works there, our doctor, Dr. Harvey, said that we could do this, and say he was supporting us for nine months to do this, um, if he was here, could we do it? And she said no. Um, that he was off somehow. Like, okay, that's messed up. Um, and so she left and we prayed about it. We were examining our options. Could we go to another hospital or do a talk to a midwife or just do a C-section? Did, did I get this all wrong? Um, and there was this very tense little period there of prayer and, and doubt. Um, and then the nurse knocks on the door and says she has good news. The other doctor that was on call, they, they had left a message for, called back, Dr. Fawcett. He is a uh, high-risk pregnancy doctor, huge supporter of VBACs. Um, and he said he'd go, go to bat for us and let us do this vaginally. So that was like, oh wow. And apparently this guy is a, a really big deal and, and one of the kind of the head honchos on the board of the hospital. And so that was awesome. But it was really, for me, it was very confusing because they just said we couldn't do this. And so another doctor named Dr. Balderston, who was in helping the, or the community medical center for a little while. He's from Eugene, Oregon. He was scheduled to fly out the next morning, um, which I think was of God. He came in, and he was pretty much our doctor for the night, basically. Um, and he gave us the rundown. You cannot turn away a woman who's in labor from a hospital. And you cannot force anybody to have a C-section legally. They did that in Chicago when it's assault and battery. They legally can't do that, obviously. And they can't turn away a, lab a woman who's in labor. It's ironic because this whole time they're trying to convince us of this, it was mostly to protect themselves from a lawsuit. Um, you know that. Um, and to me it's ironic that if they were concerned for our safety, they probably wouldn't let us go risk a vaginal birth somewhere else outside of their control. They would certainly wouldn't put a, a laboring woman out on the street. And if they really tried to avoid a lawsuit, they definitely wouldn't put a laboring woman out on the street. <laughs> but anyways, that's, you know, whatever. Um, and Dr. Ballerson went over the whole thing with how C-sections, the history of C-sections, and, and really what happened was C-sections, um, uh, doing VBACs was pretty commonplace until they came out with really good um, methods of inducing. And when they started using those induction methods, that is what usually caused the rupture in the uterus because those, when you induce, it causes contractions in a different part of the uterus. Um, and so after that, they had a lot of people got hurt, a lot of lawsuits happened, and so the general medical community decided to not do VBACs unless, you know, they're really good candidates for it. Um, nevertheless, Dr. Baldiston still, he, he displayed some concern about it, and to me that was scary. For me, the whole thing during all this was fear. I don't remember her being afraid, but she wasn't the one that was potentially going to get um, left behind. So. <laughs> um, that's why I really had to, I was praying this whole time, and really what it came down to, they, they allowed us to go into the room and start you know, doing our thing, and she was just laboring and, and going through all that, and um, it got to a point where I really had to, uh, to sit down and write out, did God tell us to have a be back? I'm leading my family into this right now, and if I'm wrong, then that's not good. Um, so I had to know that God was, was telling us to do that. Uh, one of the signs of a uterine rupture is that the baby's heart rate will go down, and so I was constantly checking the monitor. Every, every 10 seconds, I'd look up and see if the baby was still doing all right. Oh, my gosh. And the monitor would come off, and it'd go down to zero, and I'd be like, oh, no, what's happening? And it would fix it or whatever, you know. And, and it was a very, very stressful time for me. Um, so I finally sat down and wrote out, did God tell us to have a uh, VBAC? And here's that page I actually wrote on that day. And I walked through all the different things that happened to figure out yes or no. And um, like I said, our friend came from, from Hamilton, came over repeatedly to, to talk to us about it being back. We did the research, we did um, prayed about it a lot, we had peace about it. Uh, we didn't have peace about doing a C-section. Um, so before we went to the hospital, we had those three things that really um, encouraged us that God was telling us to have a VBAC. And then as soon as we get to the hospital, tons of opposition comes against us and says that we shouldn't, um, which obviously was the devil. 
And then the fact that the hospital completely pulled a 180 and even went against what they said. Um, that was a, another witness to me. Um, during this whole thing, my mom sent me a text of Isaiah 66, verse 9. And God is talking about Israel and his plan for them. It's, um, Shall I bring to the point of birth and not cause to bring forth, says the Lord? Shall I who cause to bring forth shut the womb, says your God? And uh, shall I bring to the point of delivery and not to deliver? Um, and that was very encouraging to me. And there's another point I was really praying. I was concerned. I was scared. I was saying, God, am I doing the right thing? And I texted my, my dad and some other people to, to pray that um, for me because I was so afraid. And uh, then Ben texted me um, Joshua 1.9. And a lot of you might know that offhand. Yeah. I know it more or less offhand. But I want to read it to you. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And that first part, have I not commanded you, was what really struck me. And I realized, oh, God commanded me to do this. So what's the big deal? Jesus said that um, every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. And I had um, many different things throughout that night. People... Um, encouraging us, and all the things leading up to that point that were the witnesses, I believe that um, God has commanded me. <coughs> so I had heard the voice of God. I knew he was going to be with me wherever I went. And so I knew then that the answer to the question, did God tell us to have a V-back, was yes, no matter what I felt about it. But I was still scared. <laughs> because I had that ask the question, what if God wants something to go bad? Now you can go, you know, logically, why would God want that? God cares about you. Um, he wants the best for your life. He wants the best for his name and his kingdom. Um, sometimes heartbreak is the best for that. Um, and for a long time, I've been scared of that. And so I was talking to Shay about it between contractions. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, she just helped me give it up. I finally had a, a moment of, oh, God, okay. If you want this to happen, I give up. I, I can't control anything anyway. And so I finally had to give it up. And then it gets to like 6.30 in the morning. We've been contracting since like, well, technically she's been contracting since Tuesday night. This is Friday morning. But um, we've been in the hospital since about 6 the night before. And it's just getting, you know, way intense. And finally, I'm exhausted. Shay's exhausted. Our doula is exhausted. And we're like, okay. I, I finally, during one of the contractions, I just seriously prayed to God, Jesus, within the next three contractions, please let her start pushing. Because this is, this is wearing us out. And then one contraction later, she started pushing. And uh, then we had a baby two hours later. Um, I remember Dr. Balderson coming in during all that and just smiling, giving the thumbs up. And, like that. and um, so it was, it was an amazing story to me. Um, it was good that we were in the hospital doing that because he aspirated some buconium during the birth and had to take him to ICU for a little while just to help him clear everything out and get on oxygen and stuff. Um, so for me, for me personally, I really my thing with all this is I really had to get over my personal fear, which really comes down to a selfish fear of uh, losing something that I love. Um, and I really just had to trust God that he was going to be with me. And, um, but the biggest thing I think was knowing God's voice and sticking with it, even if the whole world says you're wrong. Um, I'd like to say that I was solid the whole way through, that I, you know, I told him, God told me to do this, I don't know what you guys say, but I wasn't, I was completely back and forth, I was an emotional wreck the whole time. So, and God taught me how to just trust him, and um, so I guess that's my encouragement to you guys, is, is if you hear God's voice, stick with it, because he's going to follow through with it. Um, so if God tells you something, even if it's 10 years ago, if you know it was God, 
which check, make sure that it was God. There's other voices out there. But if you know it was God, then just do it. Just don't be afraid. I mean, because fear does nothing. Fear denies faith. If you want to be faithful to God, you cannot be afraid. It's the opposite thing. Um, and I know that because I was afraid the entire time. I wasn't having faith. <clears throat> Is there anything you want to add, Jamie? We found out that uh, Dr. Baldiston was a Christian. Dr. Baldiston from Later Morgan. Um, student a Christian. It's a pretty cool thing. Yeah. <coughs> so, does anybody have any questions about anything? <coughs> okay. Well, that's pretty much it. I didn't mean it takes so long, but uh, yes? I want to share something. Like I said, you know, about hearing the voice of the Lord. Mm -hmm. I've been down. Very, very much this couple of months. And I lost a dear, dear friend. I want to share with you, Pastor Red, I was the one that guided me, did not teach me. He guided me to hear God's voice. And he passed away Thursday, a great loss, because he was, he devoted his life. He was 17, he didn't have no children, but he was a father of many. And this is you know, in regards to you know, what you know, what to say about about them trusting the Lord and losing someone because I'm losing a lot of my dear beloved, trusted, faithful brethren. This is the first Corinthians. Chapter 15. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of the eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound that the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must be put on incorruption, and this mortal must be for immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorrupt, incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abound in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so that's what I have always encouraged everybody here and wherever I go. Is, is that one thing that we're learning in California? I have a little ministry meeting with some ladies. It's the importance of hearing God's word and the full of trust. And right now what the Lord is saying to us with this is read the chapter of the sower. Where does that seed fall? That is so important right now because it is. When the Lord comes, when he does come, are we going to be able to hear his voice? As he says, my sheep hear my voice, and they will follow me. So I praise the Lord that you, as such a young man, you are taking forth. But Brother David, David led me to, to do, to hear God's voice. So I will pray for you and your family. Thank you. My son's 24. He okay. raised five children, yeah. and he did raise them with God's word. That their children are a blessing. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. All right, well, that's that's pretty much all I have. I didn't mean to take so much time. Sorry, Dad. All right. Shay, are you praying him again? <laughs> <laughs> quite a lesson with Benji and Shay. Um, 
because when I'm hearing odds of 50-50, my heart for my son, and, and I, I don't even want to call her my daughter-in-law because she's one of the family, but, um, you know, my first reaction is, don't run the risk, take the safe route. And they came back and they said, well, we're gonna do the VBAC. And my, man, did I want to talk? Did I want to explain the logic of, and God just went boop. <laughs> <laughs> and every week, Benjamin would ask for prayer regarding the decision in here in church. And every week, I would go boop. <laughs> and I, I realized that I have a very difficult time trusting God with my children. That their relationship does not need any moderation. Any, any, God doesn't need me to make it work right. And so when they said they were going to do this, I just started praying, God, your will be done, but please keep them safe. Please keep them safe. And, you know, when Benj was sending the note and all the, the, the confrontation they were getting, um, you know, God moved on my heart because I'm not praying, God, would you just let them listen to the doctor? I'm praying, God, would you accomplish a perfect will? And if that means that we need to go to St. Pat's or to the birthing center or you change what needs to be changed there, God, I'm asking that you would accomplish your perfect will. And to see that my son and his wife hear the voice of God and they stand firm knowing, I mean, even the fact that he went back and he had to write out, that's okay. That's okay. God understands that, that we don't have a perfect faith. That's why he builds it step by step. He puts us in places where that strength, that faith is strengthened. And, and it was such a blessing when we were able to um, hear that, that they were able to do the VBAC. And, uh, because the last C-section, there was, there was quite a bit of problem with bleeding and they couldn't get the bleeding to stop. And there, of course, now is a concern on both sides. And, and so it was, uh, there was quite a bit of rejoicing when Cohen was born and, and the doctors were like, well, you know, we need to put him in the, the NICU because he aspirated some fluid. And at that point it was like, big deal. God's got this. I mean, he already took care of everything else. There's no, there was no worry, there was no concern. Oh, bummer, he doesn't get to come home the next day, but there was never any concern that there was going to be uh, an ongoing problem. Um, so, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. We're going to start in verse 1. I'm going to read this passage again just to catch everybody up uh, to where we are. Uh, we have been talking about money. And it's disconcerting to me that the majority, the vast majority of sermons that you hear in church regarding money are all based around the same principle. Give. And yet, God's Word has so many different passages of instruction concerning money, and, and relatively few of them deal with the issue of giving. And so, we started off a while back, and, and we had to come to the understanding first that it's all His. Mm -hmm. Psalms tells us that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything within it. Okay, it's all His. Okay, so we, we, as Christians, we've got to start with that understanding. God says, it's mine. Now, we are stewards of that. He puts it into our care. But nowhere in Scripture does it say it becomes ours. It's still His. We're just stewards. Then we talked about um, how you get it matters. We talked about honesty and integrity, being a good worker, being a faithful worker. 
using the testimony of your salvation so that you're working unto God beyond working for your employer. And now we're, we're talking about how you use it. So I'm going to read this parable. And um, chapter 16, the book of Luke, starting in verse 1. He also said to his disciples, he being Jesus, um, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called to him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Okay, so <clears throat> we, we've talked about the first half of this. And, and we've gotten down to uh, verse 8. Uh, the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. And then this next passage leads to a lot of confusion uh, to a lot of people that read this. And, and, and honestly, I have never heard a, a message spoken on this prior to when I heard James McDonald share on this passage. And, and I want to share with you some of what he said, some of what I've learned from other places. And um, the, the first thing that I want to point out is, for the sons of the world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Now, I, I don't know about you guys, but when I read that, it almost makes it sound like he is applauding the sons of the world and, and kind of shaming the sons of light. Now, uh, when we were in Israel, we, we kind of got a different perspective on the sons of light. Um, all the while growing up, reading that passage, I assumed the sons of light were the Christians. Okay, that makes sense, right? I mean, he is the light, and we're his sons, so we're sons of the light. And, but when we were in Israel, we went to the uh, uh, Jerusalem Museum, and we got to see uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the scrolls that were found in the Qumran village. And they are kept... In, in a building that the top of the building is shaped like one of the pots that the, the scrolls were found in, that they were kept in. And they keep water on the top of this, this clay pot roof to keep the temperature the same and consistent uh, in where the scrolls are kept. And before we went down, we were standing there and there's this, this big pot with water shooting up on it. And you're like, okay, modern art. <laughs> And we're standing next to this huge black wall. You know, thinking more modern art. I don't have a lot of use for modern art myself. <laughs> and so we had all gathered there before we moved on. And our guide was sharing with us that um, this, this actually is a representation because the, the Qumran village where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found was settled by the Essenes. Now, the Essenes were a religious group in Israel around the time of Jesus um, that felt like the, the religious leadership had failed. They, they compromised. And so they separated themselves out 
from the religious leadership from Jerusalem, and they lived in, in communities, and their belief was that they were the sons of light. And that everybody that did not agree with them, thus that was everybody outside the villages, they were the sons of the darkness, the sons of the world. And, and where we were standing, he was explaining this, this big black wall. It's not art, it's, it's a representation of the problem that, that they were exhibiting. They, they we're the sons of light and you guys are all the sons of darkness. And when God comes back for us, he's going to take us and we're going to wipe all you guys out. Okay? And so when uh, Dror was, was sharing this with us, it kind of put a little bit different twist on the sons of light because his speculation is that Jesus isn't talking about Christians and non-Christians. He's talking about the idea of separating yourself out from the world and, and keeping yourself away from, from all of those people. Okay? And, and how God, God himself is saying, this is not shrewd, this is not... What is our definition of shrewdness? Does anybody remember? Lori, you had it last time, but you probably didn't bring it today. I have it written down here somewhere. Um, or showing an ability to understand things and to make good judgment. Right. Vigorous in practical matters, having or showing an ability to understand things and make good judgments. Okay? And so we're looking at this passage, and the, the sons of light have withdrawn from the world. They're basically waiting for their Messiah to come back, and then they're going to wipe out the rest of the world, and they're going to enter into their promise. Um, first, I want to point out to you, for the sons of the world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Now, if we take this principle of separation, verse 9 begins to make a little bit more sense. Okay? Because what he's saying is separation is not what I'm calling you to, because I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth. Now, let me correct a, a misapprehension here. He's not saying go and steal so you can have friends. He's not saying extort so you can have friends. Okay? The unrighteous wealth, if you look further down in the passage, he's, he's comparing that to the eternal wealth. Unrighteous wealth is that which does not last. Okay? It fades. The, the, the moth eats it and the rust destroys it. But the eternal wealth, that's where true value lies. Okay? So when he's saying... Make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth. He's not talking, he's not encouraging us to go and do wrong so that we can have friends. Okay? So, first we address that with the understanding that the unrighteous wealth is just the wealth that, that we deal with in this life. Okay? It's stuff that is not eternal, it doesn't last. Okay? And he says, make friends for yourself. Why, would we, why do we want to use that to make friends with the unrighteous? Okay, that's not a rhetorical question. I'm asking you. Why do you want to make friends with the world? Lead them to Christ. Oh, what? Say that loud. Lead them to Christ. To lead them to Christ. What is our one purpose here on this earth? After praising God, worshiping God, what are we called to do? We're to be light to the world. We're to be salt. We're to be his witnesses, his ambassadors. Okay? And if that we can do, use temporary things and make friends with those temporary things, um, you know, the majority of our wealth goes to what? No, it's not the IRS. <laughs> Close, but no. It goes to satisfying ourselves, isn't it? You get a paycheck, what do you do with it? Well, you, you take what's left after the IRS takes theirs, and then you pay your bills, and then with whatever you might have left over or not, we go and buy stuff for ourselves, right? Because, you know, we, we have to have a bigger TV, 
I, I tell you what, one of those things that when I'm driving down the road that absolutely fascinates me, driving down the road in the evening, I look, as I'm driving by these people's houses, and I look at the size of the TVs. And it's astounding to me. Because I'm driving, I mean, when we had a 19-inch TV growing up. And that was not this way, it was this way. So, you know, it was 19 inches and it was color. Because I remember having a black and white TV. And it was color. And my dad had five remotes for it. They were Scott, Todd, Glenn, Amber, and Keith. And he'd say, put on channel nine. You know, and you'd go over and you'd put it to channel nine. And then you'd sit down and say, hey, turn that up a little bit. And you'd go and you'd turn it up. And then it would be kind of fuzzy. So one of you would go up and you'd move the ears. And because the stupid ears were loose, you had to stand there. <laughs> And that was okay, because he wasn't watching anything you were interested in anyway. Okay? But it amazes me, as I drive past these houses and I see these TVs, and it looks like full-size people. <laughs> and and it's, it just blows my mind that, I mean, I'm like, I like my space. You know? And, and when people invade my space and they get really close and they talk to you, see he's already getting defensive. <laughs> okay? Because I know people that they get into your face like this and they're just, how you doing? <laughs> Not so good then. <laughs> to, to me that just seems like having people in your face all the time. Okay? So we, we buy stuff that doesn't last. Alright? So if we understand that this unrighteous wealth is the stuff that doesn't last, and it's a means to an end. It's a means to an end. What should that end be? Our own gratification or the salvation of souls? Well, we're Americans, so that answer is obvious, right? Our own gratification. And we can slip a track in the box when the guy drops it off. Hope that he gets saved. Okay? So, Jesus is not making an issue of confusion here. He's actually clarifying something for us. He's saying, hey, look. Okay? This man was a dishonest manager. Okay? He was abusing the position that his master had given him. He was taking more than was his right to take. The master finds out about it. Now, who's the master in this scenario? Jesus. Okay? Who's the dishonest manager? Us. Well, yeah, potentially that would be us, wouldn't it? And then, who are the farmers? Because see, there's only three different actors in this, this, this play. Who, who are the farmers? Well, that would be anybody that we're taking advantage of, right? And so, when the master catches the manager and says, hey, look, you're fired. Settle the accounts. Pack your bags. Exit the building. The manager goes, oh, what am I supposed to do? I'm, I'm, I'm too weak to dig. <laughs> now, you guys think, you know, well, what kind of wimp is that? you got to go to Israel and see what they got to dig. Because <laughs> that's tough ground out there. That's one of the things that I absolutely know God has his hand on that land and that people because when his people live in his land, it flourishes. It blossoms. Streams in the desert, as God said he would do. Okay? So he says, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to adjust all the accounts. I'm taking away my robbery. I'm giving back to them not just my robbery, but my just due and I'm only going to charge them what they owe the master. And you look at what he was charging them. He, he doubled this guy's oil. And, and, and he added, you know, 20 on this guy's grain. Okay. Well, then the master commends him for his shrewdness. Now, the thing we need to understand in this part of the story is the master is not commending him for his dishonesty. He's commending him for the actions after he was confronted. Okay? 
The stuff that went before, he, he is already receiving the reward for that, isn't he? You're fired. Doesn't say that he kept him on, does it? But he commended him for his shrewdness because this man is guaranteeing himself a place of welcome, isn't he? Well, then Jesus goes on and he, and he takes this parable because all parables are given that we can understand a deeper truth, right? He makes it simple because we're dumb. You get that? Because you have an infinite God who knows everything at all time talking to me and I can't keep track of what I'm supposed to do 10 minutes from now. That's why God gave me Christy. We get in the car to go and I get to the end of the road and say, where are we going? Which is a problem because I'm driving. And she'll tell me, oh, we're going to Hamilton or we're going to Stevensville. A lot of times I don't ask and I turn and she'll ask me, well, where are we going? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I was driving. <laughs> okay. So he makes things simple for us, but we've complicated this because we don't understand the context in which this is being used. So moving forward, one who is faithful, verse 10, in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. That's pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? Isn't it? It seems to be. I mean, if I can trust you with a dollar, I could trust you with a hundred dollars. If I could trust you with a hundred dollars, I could trust you with a thousand dollars. If I can't trust you with a dollar, why in the world would I give you ten? Or a hundred? Alright? We're seeing a principle that's being laid out here. Verse 11, if then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with the true riches? See the comparison that's being made here? It's actually a contrast. The unrighteous wealth, that which doesn't last, that's the stuff that we deal with here on earth. And this stuff doesn't last. There's no righteousness. It's not holy. It's profane. It's common. If we don't use that well, why would we ever be entrusted with the eternal riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, because whose is it? God's. It's all God's. Okay? Remember, that's the foundation from which everything that we deal with on money is built. It's all His. Alright? So, if I'm not faithful what what is His... Why would he give me that which is my own? What is, what is he referring to there? What would be my own? Anybody? That's right. The, the, the inheritance in the kingdom. The jewels and the crown. The riches. And all of that stuff that when I see him, I take and I throw at his feet because I realize he's worthy of all of that and more. Okay? So if I am not faithful with the unrighteous wealth and I get to heaven and I get the two little gold coins and that's all I have to throw before his feet and do, do you think how, how is that going to make you feel that when you stand before heaven it doesn't matter how big your TV was your honor it, it doesn't matter doesn't matter what kind of car you drove doesn't matter how padded your account was doesn't matter how big your house was because when you get to heaven, that stuff doesn't come with you. It's, it's left behind. As a matter of fact, I, I'm reminded of the parable that Jesus told about the, the rich farmer. And he looked around and he said, my, I, I've gathered in so many crops that I can't store them all in my barns. What shall I do? I know. I'll buy a bigger TV. <laughs> and he spends his money and he builds a bigger barn and he starts throwing all his stuff in the bigger barn, and that night he dies. What good did all of that do him? <coughs> no one. Didn't do any good. He's gone. He can't take it with him. He's called a fool. So if he was not faithful with the unrighteous stuff, when he stands before God, why would God entrust him with eternal riches? Now see, this is the boat we are in, folks. See, there's, there is common sense economics in how we deal with money, but there is spiritual truth that underlies and supersedes that common sense. 
Because if we don't operate from the principle that it is all his and that we are stewards, and we must give an account for it to our master, that we must someday present to him, hey, hey, this is what I did with what you gave me. Man, did you see that TV? I mean, it covered my whole wall. God's not impressed. He's not impressed. Okay? But God, did you see how much I saved? Did you see my 401k? Yeah, son, I got streets of gold. Okay? If we understand the principle that he has given to us generously, and I'll tell you what, if you're living in America, you have received generously. All right? You have received generously, almost to the point that I think that's more the devil's hand than God's. Because it's lulled us into such a place of comfort that we don't really need God, do we? We go, <coughs> oh. hey doc, I got a whatever. But we, we've got doctors everywhere. And we can go to them. And we can get medicine to help us feel better. We don't need God to be our healer. We have got programs and programs and programs. We don't need God to be Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. So we get to this place where God is a convenience. We'll, we'll take Him if He doesn't interfere too much with our lives. But when it comes to real living, we have this box for God and, and we put Him there and say, don't come out till Sunday. Then I pull him out, I put him on, I go to church. And on the way home, I pull him out, put him back in the box, and, and away he goes. We don't have a desperation for God. I want to get this done. I'm going to, I'm going to finish this up really quickly. <clears throat> Verse 13. I think when dealing with money, this is the place that we have got to live. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Okay, so we have two masters. We have God and we have money. And, and the word there, man, it's not just cash, okay? It's possessions. It's stuff, okay? It's, it's the things that you spend yourself to get, okay? And if you are devoted to God, then money should have no hold on you. And if you're kind of questioning which of those is true. Take that item that you love the most, that TV or, you know, what, whatever it is, that, that you, your car or whatever, and see if you're willing to give it up. See if God would ask you to let go of it if you'd be willing to let go. How tightly are you holding on to your mammon? But God, it's mine. No, it's not yours. It's His. Amen. You see, when you hold on so tightly to what it is you have, you can't receive anything, can you? Because see, God promises us uh, in, in Proverbs that the observation and natural flow is that if you sow generously, you reap generously. And if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. And it's a, it's a test of your heart. Remember when we started this, I told you that money is a test. It's a test, it's a test, it's a test. Now, I want to encourage you, next week, we're getting to that subject that I have never preached on before. And uh, it is a critical issue. We're talking about money. We're going to talk about giving. All right? We're going to take a biblical look at giving. But I, I want you to go... I want to be here to hear what Pastor Glenn has to say and not go, I think it's a good day for a picnic. <laughs> because look, I'm not going to ask you for your money. I don't care for your money because you are not my provider. God is my provider. Amen. Okay? And even though sometimes I scratch my head, because I'll tell you what, the last week was absolutely crazy with our provision. Because you know when you give someone permission to deposit money in your account, they also have permission to take it out. And when somebody pushes the wrong button and it goes out, it's gone. 
I want to share with you the blessing that God has called us to in giving. Okay? So we're going to talk about that next week. It'll probably take us about two weeks to get through. But this passage here, let's, let's render this down simply. Okay? There is unrighteous wealth that God has poured into you. It's the wealth of this life. It's temporary. It's not eternal. Amen. We need to use those resources to make friends. Why to make friends? Because look at what it says here, verse 9. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves uh, by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, when all of that stuff is gone, and, and what he's talking about is the end of your life, not bankruptcy. Okay, He's talking about the end of this life. He says, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. The unrighteous wealth is going to win them for Christ that on that day I go and I stand before Him, they're going to be there welcoming me home. Do, do you understand the exchange? I'm getting rid of the, the temporary in exchange for something eternal. Not just for myself, but for others. Okay? So, if God has given you a little, be faithful with a little, because when you're faithful with a little, He can trust you with much. Keep in mind, Mammon wants you to hold on to it tight. Don't let it go. God says keep that hand open. Because as I pour in, I can take out. And when I take out, I can pour more in. Amen. And you can't outgive him. Everything is his. Everything is his. Yeah. Father, I bless you this morning. I thank you for the faithfulness of your word. For the truth of your word. And we ask, Lord God, that you would settle in our hearts and our minds. That, Father, so much of this, this prosperity, this, this money, this, these possessions are, are just traps that entangle us, that, that hinder our walk, that hinder the freedom that we have in you. That we work and we work and we work to build bigger barns. But we can't take them with us and, and they're of no effect in eternity. That all that you have given us is yours, and that, Father, we should spend it wisely, shrewdly. Shrewdly. That, Father, we would honor you with all that you have given us. And that, Father, we would always use that as an opportunity to, to testify, to witness, to speak the great truth that there is a loving God who has made a way for lost to be found and dead to be raised to life. And we bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.